thank you for attending this event, uh, everyone who is there, um, and welcome everyone to King's College uh, and to the University of Cambridge. So this is an event on the uh, King's Wildflower Meadow. Uh, I'm Jeff Mogridge, I'm a Fellow of King's, uh, and I'm going to be moderating this event. Um, we had a, a, a similar event on the Wildflower Meadow last year, and so what we're going to try and do this year is, first of all, obviously give you an update on developments, uh, which are very exciting um, since last year, but also try and put the meadow a bit more into the context of other um, biodiversity and conservation initiatives uh, around the college and a little bit uh, around the university. Um, and hopefully that will uh, give us an idea of why these things matter and perhaps inspire us all to do some things ourselves along these lines. Um, and also give us a feeling in which uh, King's uh, and the university are taking a, a lead uh, in initiatives to try and encourage um, biodiversity. And I think one of the nice things about the Wildflower Meadow is that it's a very public example uh, of that happening. But it's important, of course, to realise that it's by no means uh, the only thing which is happening within the college or within the, the wider university. So we've got uh, three fantastic experts uh, here today uh, to help me uh, describe this. Uh, so first of all, uh, Stephen Coghill, who's the head gardener at King's, uh, and he is responsible for creating uh, the Wildflower Meadow and indeed many of the other uh, examples we're going to talk about uh, this afternoon. Uh, and then we've got Cicely Marshall, um, who is uh, a plant ecologist and a botanist and also a fellow of King's, and Sebastian Eves van den Acker, uh, who is um, a plant scientist and a molecular biologist, and again, uh, a fellow of King's. And they are the two people who've led um, the scientific investigation of how the Meadow uh, project has affected biodiversity uh, on the back lawn of King's. And so in particular, what they're gonna tell you about is the methods used uh, in that study. And then of course, uh, some of the outcomes of, of that study. Um, the, the questions uh, are going to be submitted uh, via the Q&A, so I'd encourage you all to submit questions throughout the event. Um, the the Q&A session will happen towards the end uh, of the event. So um, I just, first of all, um, we're going to show you a very short video um, updating you on what's been happening in the meadow this year. Um, and also introducing a little bit of some of the research that Cecily and Sebastian have done. And then after the video, Cicely and Sebastian will talk for around 10 minutes in more detail about that research. So if we could have the first video now, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to King's College Wildflower Meadow. My name is Stephen Coghill. I'm the head gardener here. This is the, the meadow's second year of asking, and here we can see uh, thousands of oxeye daisies, thousands of corn chamomile, a uh, sprinkling of poppy cornflowers, uh, which produces a very rich biodiverse sward that uh, the college is very excited about. The Great Lawn has been a lawn here since around about 1750. Way back in the day, you had very close mown lawns or, or close side lawns as a demonstration of the fact that you were so fabulously wealthy, you could have all this productive land and not do much with it other than act as a foil for the amazing buildings and of course the, the amazing chapel. But as time has gone past, land has to work for its living. Sustainability and biodiversity are two of the watchwords as we walk through into the 21st century. I'm Cicely Marshall. I'm a research fellow in biology with King's. I'm a botanist and ecologist, and uh, my role with the meadow has been to coordinate a biodiversity monitoring survey. We've tripled the number of plant species in the meadow compared to the remaining lawn or the original lawn as it was. We've been doing a bat survey this year for the first time, and bats have wide territories, right? They'll fly miles and miles, but even for a species with such large ranges, you can tell the difference between the meadow and the lawn in terms of foraging and where they hunt. The, the bats come and hunt over the meadow because there's more insects here. We're going to see more and more wildflower treatments to landscapes and gardens. Cambridge City Council are, in, uh, are doing this even as we speak. And uh, the meadow has created a huge amount of interest within the other gardens within the university. 
The bales that we harvested last year went out to just about every college within the university. Jesus College, the head gardener there, Paul, actually took a Henry Hoover to his bale and extracted about a, a kilogram and a half of wildflower seed, which now forms their meadow. It's a good news story that uh, you know, it feeds on itself. It's just great to see people walking through it. It's great to see people experiencing it. Not only do you have the, the physical experience of being in a meadow, being surrounded by everything, by the insects, the butterflies, you have the bird song, but you can also, you know, waft along with your hands. You can sort of feel it as you, as you go through. So it, we've got a sensory thing here. You've also got a tactile thing as well. And the ability to be able to completely immerse yourself in a meadow like this is something that we need to do more often. Here's a fantastic example of what you can do if you have a mind to. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, so Jeff has um, introduced me, but let me uh, introduce myself again as Cicely Marshall, a fellow in biology with King's. Um, I work from the Cambridge Conservation Initiative uh, based in the David Attenborough building here uh, and um, the plant sciences department. So our ambition at King's is to increase the biodiversity value of our grounds whilst um, reducing our inputs and greenhouse gas emissions. And my uh, role in this enterprise has been to run a biodiversity monitoring program of our new meadow to monitor the changes in species composition year on year. Uh, so the first thing we did there was to take a biodiversity uh, baseline survey to record what was there of this lawn um, before we sowed the meadow. And that was in summer 2019 before the meadow was planted. Uh, we were out there again um, last summer 2020 and this summer 2021 um, and we'll keep going out and recording what's, um, what's there every year at least while the meadow is changing really rapidly in this early phase and we do that so we can measure quantitatively whether we are successful against our goal of increasing biodiversity uh, and um, to inform the way that we manage the meadow and indeed the wider um, King's footprint. Uh, I'm happy to say that we have had success. Uh, what we found has been surprising and very rewarding. Uh, I will tell you about the changes we've seen above ground and then hand over to Sebastian, who will tell us about the changes we've seen in the below ground biodiversity. So in terms of results, uh, by planting the meadow, we have tripled the number of plant species in that first flowering summer. Uh, the meadow supported around 60 plant species compared with just 20 plant species when it was lawn. And this year, 2021, that number is more like four times uh, as more of the perennial plant species start to establish. Those plant species provide food and shelter for invertebrates species like insects, and spiders. Uh, and in the first year of the meadow, so last summer, we found about three times as many invertebrates using the meadow than the lawn. So that's a, a tripling of invertebrate species richness to match a tripling of plant species richness. Uh, this year, we had five times the number of true bugs and spider species in the meadow compared with the lawn. And it's exciting to see this upward trend, uh, and that's likely the result of the increasing floral diversity and uh, increased specialism in both the plants and uh, insect species. For example, we had lots of small copper butterflies this year. That's a species um, whose caterpillars feed on sorrel, which is a plant that we had a lot of this year in the meadow. Um, when we mowed the uh, path, into the meadow this year for the, we, we thought we were mowing them in for um, visitors for access and be able to submerge themselves in the uh, meadow. The meadow, um, the butterflies, the small copper butterflies thought we were creating glades for them. Uh, small copper butterflies, are, the males are very territorial and um, it's nice to see uh, lots of um, male small coppers defending these glades um, as their territory. 
so we're starting to attract uh, specialist meadow species uh, like the small coppers, also the meadow brown butterflies, and um, had some six spot burnet moths as well. And all this insect biomass and biodiversity is really good news for the mammal species further up the food chain. This year we've been monitoring our bat population with static detectors. We set one detector up by the meadow and one detector up by the lawn. And what we found was that bats forage three times as often over the meadow than they do over the lawn um, because the insects, um, because the hunting is much better over the meadow because there's more insects there. The best habitat on uh, in college actually still is uh, Scholar's Peace, which is a bit of rough, uh, rough grazing pasture on the west of the river. And um, we also we set a static bat detector there as well, and the bats hunt three times more often again over the um, over Scholar's Peace, and that's the influence of the river um, acting as a navigational corridor for bats and um, also providing. Uh, lots of insect biomass that comes off the river. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, all I want to say about the above ground um, changes for now. Let's uh, hand over to Sebastian to talk about below ground changes. All right, thanks very much, Cicely. So um, as Jeff introduced in the beginning, I'm a fellow of King's College, uh, and I also work in the Department of Plant Sciences at the Crop Science Centre, and that's actually where I am right now. I'm kind of um, generally interested in what happens to or on plants um, below ground, as Cicely was saying. You know, we often overlook what happens below ground, um, you know, because we simply can't see it. Um, but it's very important um, to, you know, everything uh, that's going on below ground anyway, but also to what's happening up above ground, so all the things we can see. Um, so in this study, when we started looking at biodiversity uh, on the king's backs, I thought uh, it would be great to study um, below ground and a group of organisms that probably, I would say, most people have never heard of. Uh, and yet they're everywhere. Uh, and these are nematodes. So these nematodes are uh, tiny, really microscopic worms, much, much uh, smaller than human hair. And they're really important parts of many ecosystems. Some of these worms will eat plants, others will eat bacteria, others will eat other nematodes or um, other animals. And there's such integral parts of the smooth functioning of uh, ecosystems that even the relative distributions of those types, so the number of plant eaters versus the number of bacteria eaters versus the number of carnivores, etc., can tell you a lot about the system you're looking at and the stability or the age or the functioning of the system you're looking at. So while we were digging holes um, for the beetle traps so that we could um, assess their diversity in number, we took the soil, brought it back to our labs um, and extracted the nematodes and sequenced their genes so that we could tell who um, was present in the original sample, so which species were present. Now, we've been tracking this for the same number of years, um, as Cicely mentioned, and although the rate of change of things below ground is typically much slower than the rate of change of things above ground, um, Again, as Cicely said, we're already seeing the impact of the re rewilding um, below ground. So the disturbance has definitely been noticed uh, by the community. Uh, and we'll continue to track this for the following years um, to really answer the questions like, um, you know, when does this community below ground enter a new kind of stable equilibrium? Um, what is the makeup of that equilibrium? And how does that differ um, from the unchanged side of the back lawn as kind of our, our baseline? Okay, that's all I want to say uh, for now about the Belograd works. So I'm going to hand back to Cicely. Thanks. Yeah, so, yeah, it's uh, uh, this year, um, and Sebastian and I both really enjoyed having students back in college a bit to join in with these uh, data collecting activities. And um, they've been, oh, we've been working with the second year ecologists and um, third year uh, project students uh, to, who have been analysing these data. and. Um, using them for the project and they're not not just king students they're from all over the collegiate university and uh, they take these ideas back to their colleges um and uh, you know carry out similar studies um in their colleges i was uh, um meeting this morning with um uh, representatives from john's and claire colleges um, to talk about uh, some biodiversity monitoring activities and improvements we could be making um, along the river cam back through um through the city so that's been a, a really um positive <laughs> change this year compared to last year it's been having the students with us 
um, we uh, we run, we run this um, voluntarily, um, absolutely, and uh, it's been we rely completely on um, the specialist uh, skills um, of lots of people working locally uh, to donate their time and expertise um, to working with us um, to, to do this monitoring. And uh, uh, so while I've got this platform, I'd like to um, uh, say that I'm always very happy uh, to hear from uh, alumni, um, anyone in the audience with the uh, skills and anything, naturalist, anything really, um, we'd, uh, we'd love to hear from you and um, to get involved. Uh, I think, um, uh, can we hand over to Steve, perhaps, to introduce the next video and say something about um, biodiversity at King's more generally? Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yes, yeah, <clears throat> your floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much. Well, um, welcome to my potting shed, everybody. Um, every gardener should have a potting shed. I even have one with raffia, so I'm, I'm feeling uh, very, very uh, fulfilled at the moment as a gardener. <laughs> From a point of view of um, biodiversity, uh, it's um, an interesting uh, topic. It's one of the, the two hot topics that we look at when we're involved in landscape and garden management biodiversity and sustainability but um, these days when you're looking at land managing a landscape or a garden you have to consider how you make it as biodiverse as you can uh, particularly when uh, you know the wildlife um, the flora fauna are under such pressure in this country where there are just so many of us two-legged creatures um, so from that point of view uh, at Kings, we're trying to make an exemplar of, of um, areas so that we can demonstrate to visitors and um, other colleges, work with other colleges to uh, present ourselves in as biodiverse way as possible. I mean, the meadow is a, is a fantastic example of that. Uh, we've had such fun with that this year. Uh, the amount of biomass that's come off it when we harvested it is now we've gone from something like 100 bales last year to 322, would you believe? So it's been really, really good. Uh, not only that, but uh, bringing the horses in to manage it was a sort of a, a way of attempting to demonstrate that you can actually reduce the amount of carbon that you put into managing these meadows by using uh, horses. And of course, the other great thing about horses is that um, one of the byproducts of the horses is fantastic for the roses. So, you know, everybody wins. <laughs> I mean, looking uh, um, away from the meadow, though, uh, we are we are sort of uh, considering other areas. Uh, next door to the meadow, you've probably seen in the video, uh, our Clare border, which is a xeriscape. In other words, it's a border that consists of plants that require very little in the way of water, very little in the way of, um, of management, uh, and also are um, highly prized nectar-bearing plants, uh, particularly the two etiums. Is uh, the giant um, uh, buglosses that we have from the Canary Islands that uh, are essentially nothing more than sort of vertical banqueting tables for our bees. And uh, our bees are actually on Scholar's Piece, so there's a sort of a, a good flight line from Scholar's Piece right into the Clare border and back. Um, it's been a, a very effective demonstration of what you can actually do in terms of uh, aesthetic uh, horticultural display. But at the same point in time, uh, it's also been very, very useful for nectar and pollen bearing uh, uh, um, uh, means that uh, insects uh, love and desire. Um, so moving away from, oh yes, and before I move away from the Clare border, I should say thank you very, very much to Clare College. Um, all the echiums and everything else, these gigantic plants sort of erupt past the windows of Clare College's bar. So, so the next time I'm in there, I'll, uh, I'll buy a few pints, all right? <laughs> uh, moving on from Clare, uh, Bodley's Court. Um, where, um, Bodley's Court is a, an amazing 
a place that has recently had a new roof put on. And of course, it was the uh, the accommodation that uh, Turing and Ian Forster and Zhuzhi Mo actually uh, spent time in. So it's uh, it's a fascinating place. When we put the landscape back together again after the roof went on, though, we put in gabions um, and gabions full of the same Ancaster stone that Bodleys is actually made out of, but uh, um, as uh, dry stone walls. And the fantastic about, thing about these dry stone walls and the gabions is that they produce a huge surface area that's fantastic for arthropods. And uh, we can also grow a, a range of um, alpine style plants or um, uh, coastal plants that can put up with very, very dry conditions. Uh, and as time goes by, we are going to see them populated by lichens and lichens are great and we should have more of them. So. Hopefully we can have a little lichen garden in, in, uh, in times to come. While we're down by the river, I think it's interesting to note that uh, we are looking at um, uh, supporting uh, otter populations on the CAM. And we're, we're currently, uh, via Sicily's good offices, uh, looking at how we can, um, we can actually build an otter halt, uh, an artificial otter halt, um, down hiding under one of the willow trees as we get towards Clare College. Uh, because I think it'd be really, really great if we had our very own tarka swimming up and down. It would actually match very nicely with the kingfisher that, uh, that Clare College has, has in, in one of their walls. You know, if, if Clare can have a kingfisher, I'm sure we can have an otter. <laughs> so that's something that uh, we're, we're looking at very closely at the moment. We're taking that to the Gardens Committee quite shortly. Um, other initiatives. Well, we have a wonderful community orchard. If you go to Old Gardens Hostel, um, the site many, many years ago used to be at tennis courts. And um, the, uh, the tennis courts have been replaced by an orchard consisting of a, a wide range of different fruits. You know, essentially, we're looking at a permaculture orchard. It's this, basically permaculture is all about um, having useful edible plants uh, um, at your fingers tip so that you can just go and stroll out and set your teeth into something tasty. And that's what we encourage the students in Old Gardens Hostel to do and um, the fruit that isn't consumed by our students or our guests. Uh, uh, gardeners consume themselves. <laughs> and as time goes by and we find... Uh, uh, larger and larger fruits then of course we'll be taking uh, the fruit into um, uh, our kitchens which I think would be super. There's a fantastic tradition of fruit growing and orchards and the like within within the university and of course that sort of uh, um, died away after the second world war and um, you know fruit was brought in but I think now is the time for more healthy fruit uh, to be uh, grown on site. Uh, not only is it traditional it's also yummy and it travels all the way from the orchard to your stomach uh, with <laughs> very few, uh, very few in the way of, uh, of carbon, uh, carbon using miles. Uh, one of the other things that we're very, very keen to encourage our students to do is to um, take on allotments and uh, the, the new academic year starts shortly and uh, we have an allotment champion who will be working to uh, um, encourage students to um, work some of the individual plots that we have in the Fellows Garden and also at Grasshopper and Cranmer. Um, uh, uh, David Kay, our new gardener, will be getting involved in this one. And uh, associated with the allotments, of course, we also have on the Fellows Garden a wild garden area with a, with a pond. So uh, we'll be restoring the pond, but so that's become home to a fantastic range of uh, dragonflies this year. It's been really very special um right how are we doing for time um 29 here we go yeah um a little, it's worth talking about some of our accommodation um off-site now um just recently uh we've um landscaped and designed and planted up uh, the uh, a planting scheme around Grasshopper and Cranmer Lodges up on uh, Grange Road. That in itself has been a fascinating process because here we've had the opportunity to walk the talk in terms of producing a landscape that's great for wildlife, aesthetically pleasing, and actually complements the passive house um, uh, buildings that are, are now on the site. Um, and here we worked with the Landscape Architects uh, Practice LDA to come up with a matrix planting scheme that saw a wide range of herbaceous perennial plants, some native, 
of some of uh, exotic um, that uh, not only produce nectar, produce pollen, but are also um, florally very attractive. And because of the nature, because they're herbaceous perennial plants, they you know they grow up. We cut them down. Uh, they regenerate. The landscape's very very dynamic. And we uh, took a lot of the research that uh, Nigel Dunnett and uh, James Hitchmo have put together at Sheffield University, and employed um, plant groups that really uh, complement the site. Um, it's worked really nicely. And in order to give us uh, a lot of excitement and interest early in the season, we have a thing called a vernal layer, which is sounds really cool. Uh, that's essentially a, a wide spectrum uh, bulb planting so that we, uh, we have things flowering from January onwards. Um, Although I must say, uh, when we installed uh, the uh, the bulbs, it was a, a particularly horrible week, and uh, I think it, it uh, took most of the rest of the month to actually get our boots dry. <laughs> but here we're looking at uh, native bluebells, uh, native snowdrops. We're looking at um, Narcissus bulbacodium, which is a, a beautiful little narcissus, which is fantastic for nectar and pollen. We're looking at um, Aranthus hymalis with the, uh, the winter aconite, um, anemones, anemone nemorosa, and uh, just a huge range of plants that sort of uh, underplant the herbaceous perennials that actually then come through. Um, in terms of the herbaceous perennials themselves, well, we concentrated on um, a lot of uh, native, or a lot of geraniums. Uh, we've also um, uh, had meadow rue establish itself really well, and uh, lots of Saxifraga umbrosa, amongst many other things, including good old Verbena benariensis, which uh, you can never get enough of. So the planting style and installation we've learnt a lot from, and uh, we will be um, taking the ideas from uh, Grasshopper and Cranmer and then employing, uh, employing them in a new site, which uh, will be coming along very shortly uh, up on Barton Road. Uh, and Barton Road, of course, uh, it's Croft Gardens. It's an area where we have a slightly more woodland feel to it. So uh, the plant mixes that we'll be using there will have a sort of a more of a woodland twang to them, which I think will be very good. So altogether, we are working um, across the site uh, to diversify our landscapes. And uh, uh, in terms of um, the way that we manage them, um, reduce the labour input uh, in order to uh, make them as friendly as possible. Um, we're converting a lot of our two-stroke petrol equipment into um, electric uh, tools now, and uh, that makes a big difference. Um, so... Uh, a lot of the petrol gear that you see and hear from colleges actually uh, um, in the next few years will be will be fading away. And instead of the throaty roar of a two-stroke engine, you'll get the quiet hum of a bushless electric uh, motor. And believe you me, it's uh, we're happy to use them as indeed uh, as indeed uh, the um, environment is happy not to have to put up with all the noise and pollution that comes off the back of them. Right, well, I think we're actually reaching a point now where we can uh, move along into our next video. If, um, if the running order is um, being followed. Um, so uh, if I can uh, introduce a video that looks at some of the issues that I've been highlighting here and uh, allows you to sort of see a get a flavor of uh, some of the um, some of the images that, uh, that go along with the, the narrative that I've just put through. I'm Michael Proctor, I'm the Provost or Head of King's College and I have general responsibility for everything that goes on in the College. I'm also Chair of the Gardens Committee at the College, oversight of the gardens here. And I grew up on a farm and I saw at first hand the tension between producing food at low cost and the lack of biodiversity. So many students, and in fact all of us, are very conscious of what's going on in the environment and they want to maintain the environment that we have almost lost. So I think the initiative of planting up some of the back lawn has been an amazing success, much admired by other colleges and by the town in general. And I think it will catch on and just bring to people's attention just how much we've lost. We must maintain and enhance the biodiversity of our surroundings. 
The Fellows Garden is an amazing space. Uh, a Victorian pleasure garden, an informal space with lots of island borders and specimen plantings and trees that were possibly new to the country that uh, were scientifically interesting. You have to respect where it came from, its history, and also the, the context that it's in. All green waste that comes out of the gardens and all wood or woody material is chipped and reused. Uh, none of it goes to waste. We have this wonderful green wedge coming right the way into Cambridge. It's a wildlife corridor and it's something that we don't take for granted. A guy called Charles Dowding, who's a particular uh, horticulturalist and vegetable grower, and he has what he calls a no-dig method, which is where you, you're trying not to disturb the soil too much, so you're fostering soil development. So we dug over the entire site once with a load of compost into it, and then since then it's just you put a mulch on top every winter. All these raised beds, they're given out to individual students at the start of every academic year. And then the main plot and the greenhouse are then kind of communal resources. This is our wild orchard. It's an area that the students can basically come out and roam in. Also, all of the fruit trees that are here, when anything ripens, they're welcome to come in here and graze, pick the fruit, or eat the fruit straight off the tree, sitting down on the ground or on the benches, or in our amazing Edwardian revolving summer house. Here is a sort of a safety valve, a relief valve from all the pressure of, of uh, constant academic study. Yeah, so here we are at Cranmer Road, our Cranmer Road development. The buildings itself uh, are award-winning, a uh, passive house from the sustainability side. And uh, the landscape that surrounds it is very much orientated towards sustainability and biodiversity. It's a matrix planting scheme with lots of herbaceous perennial plants that basically move around to form communities that are self-sustaining. Uh, we also have student engagement as well with student allotments and uh, also some uh, fruit espaliers here which are very popular to give a little bit of uh, privacy but also at the same time something to eat in the autumn. The Wildflower Meadow has inspired us as a college to think more uh, widely about how we look after our biodiversity. It really supports a lot more insect biomass, so the insect species richness is about double. It is definitely doing its bit for local conservation. Those of us who had not thought about biodiversity in a general way now realise that we can actually make a difference. We want to get back to something more natural, less wasteful, and everybody is on board in the college with that. So thank you, Steve, Cicely and Sebastian. That was a fantastic insight into all the hard work you've been doing uh, over the last year, indeed the last two years um, on the meadow and beyond. Um, we're now going to move into the uh, final part of this, um, this session, which is um, a question and answer. We've got about 20 minutes. We've got lots of questions coming already, but please do keep them coming in. Um, as many as possible would be great. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to start so the first question um, is, is, what's the best time to visit? I think this is a really important question. Um, I think late, mid to late June is probably the, the perfect time. That obviously depends a bit on the, the year and what the weather's been like. So I think this year, everything was a little bit later than the first year of the meadow um, because of the very dry spring, I would assume. And the other thing I think to highlight in, in um, response to that question is that this year, for the first time, we put some paths uh, through the meadow. I think you probably saw them on one of those videos, the aerial view of the meadow. And that's been a really fantastic addition uh, for students and fellows and staff members in the college, but also for visitors. So all visitors are able to walk through the meadow to smell it. One of my favourite things about the meadow is, is the fragrance, particularly when it's slightly damp, uh, and to feel it and to touch it. So, so it's a full sensory pleasure uh, coming to visit the meadow now. And yes, yeah, so, so May, June, but I think mid to late June probably is the absolute um, top time. Um, so um, next question we've got uh, is, um, sorry, I've lost myself slightly here. Um, so we've had a lot of interest in scholars pieces, actually. Um, so ranging from obviously that's a piece of rough ground on the other side of the river to where the, uh, the meadow is. Um, and so there's questions ranging from why did we put the meadow uh, on the side of the river we did rather than on scholars pieces? 
to can we use it as a gauge for the success of the meadow? Uh, do we plan to do anything different with scholars pieces? How long has it been managed in the way that it has? So there's lots of different questions there. Um, and perhaps I could ask Cicely to start off in answering that question, and then I'll come to Steve a bit more on the management of scholars pieces uh, now and in the past. So Cicely, could you start off there? Sure, yeah. Um, so is it unmanaged? Uh, no, it's not. It's managed as pasture land. Uh, so that's land that's grazed um, at the moment by four cows, uh, um, as compared with um, a meadow, which is a land that's managed for a hay crop. Uh, it, how long has it been rough ground um, is an interesting question. The um, fashions come and go. It's, it's tempting to think of um, the back landscape as unchanging, and it, it's really not. Um, it's changed a lot as, as fashions have changed. Um, so in the in the 1600s, it was uh, marshy land, not developed at all, really. And then by around 1700, um, it became much more structured, and the the original King's Bridge was uh, lined up with the current um, Porter's Lodge, so it was in a different place than where it is now. Uh, and Scholar's Piece was planted up much more formally with um, trees. There was a fashion for um, keeping, making land productive. Uh, so we had um, a mound and a duck pond there for uh, a while. And then um, by 1800, uh, the fashion changed again um, towards keeping, showing how wealthy you were by how much land you could keep out of productivity. Uh, and we had this um, sort of lighter grazing um, landscape, um, which used to be uh, sheep and then um, uh, switched to cows because the, the sheep were too, were too puntable. The students kept um, putting the sheep onto punts and punting them off down the river <laughs> for a lark. Um, but we're, yeah, so and we're, and we're still on, on uh, cattle grazing now on Father's Peace. Um, we tend not to use it as the control point for the meadow. We compare it to the lawn um, because that's what um, that's what the that area was um, before uh, before um, before it was meadow. It was lawn, so um, that's what we compare against. Uh, um, it's really uh, this is an important point to make. It's really difficult to maintain formal lawn um, in Cambridge and generally, and that it's really only getting harder. It takes an awful lot of um, water and fertilising and pest control to keep a formal lawn going. Um, and what's really changed recently is the preponderance of chafer beetle larvae. Um, so the chafer beetle itself is this um, big, rather beautiful beetle um, that uh, um, crashes around <laughs> in vegetation. It's a scarab family um, beetle. Uh, it's rather beautiful. But the, uh, it spends most of its life as a larva something a bit like a beetle larva, something that looks a bit like a caterpillar, underneath the, um, in the soil of lawns, eating through grass roots, which makes the lawn really loose and brown and dry. Uh, and then crows come along and pull up the turf to eat these beetles. And you can watch them doing it. They've absolutely cracked this game, these crows in um, Cambridge, and they just, they come every day and um, tear, up, tear up the lawn. Uh, there used to be a uh, pesticide that, to control these, um, chafer larvae and it's not legal anymore it uh, builds up too much in the soil and it um, causes too many uh, um, knock-on difficulties that's not legal so there's no way to control these um, chafer beetle and um, thus maintaining formal lawn is is really difficult um, which is uh, uh, yeah an important um, co-benefit of um, changing moving away from a, a formal lawn into um, a wildflower meadow aesthetically it's something that we can sort of manage better in the future as a college. So um, Steve can I ask you I mean maybe to comment a little bit on on scholars pieces if there's anything to add but also there's a question on on how we cooperate with other colleges and how the flower meadow has influenced that so perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that there was something in the video but a little more detail would be really interesting. <laughs> Uh, that's right, Jeff. I'll, I'll start with uh, Scholar's Piece. I mean, firstly, Scholar's Piece is actually quite low, low lying. <laughs> Therefore, uh, in, in times gone by, it's uh, it's uh, flooded a lot more than um, the uh, 
great lawn next door to it on the other side of the bank. Um, the problem with that with deposition is you get a huge amount of uh, nutrient buildup from from the river. So it's actually quite a quite a nutrient uh, rich um, uh, meadow, which means that it's difficult to establish uh, a lot of the wildflowers that prefer, of course, you know, mesotrophic low low nutrient conditions. Um, in the past, uh, we have um, a, a plug planting has taken part. Um, I was having a look in the archives. Uh, uh, plug planting, uh, getting on towards the river, wildflower plugs more robust, uh, so protected by a electric fence to keep the uh, grazing beasts out while they established. Unfortunately, the uh, <laughs> the the plugs were a, a blooming sight more tasty than the surrounding meadow, and the cows broke down the electric fence and ate the plugs, uh, which is a which is a bit of a hazard when you when you're dealing with uh, when you're dealing with um, livestock which uh, has, a, has a mind of its own um, therefore the uh, scholars piece itself is is you know primarily used as, as grazing for um, our livestock which are red pole bullocks this year um, we could look at uh, um, uh, more plug planting schemes that is something that we could certainly have a look at but uh, I think it's important that we don't limit the amount of uh, grazing which is available to the uh, to the red pole, particularly since uh, you know we we're seeing more and more droughts, so I wouldn't want to uh, I wouldn't want to have uh, hungry bullocks on my hand. That wouldn't be that wouldn't be good at all. <laughs> so that's where we, that's where we are at the moment. We we basically run livestock on it. Um, we do a few uh, clean up cuts, uh, but when it comes to any you know sort of pestilential or injurious weeds that we find ourselves in there, like um, Snechia jacobia uh, or the thistles and the like, when then we'll go in there and we'll we'll pull them by hand to uh, to you know so we're not going in there using any selective herbicides or anything else like that. Um, now then, as for um, cooperating with other colleges, uh, uh, this year the harvesting of the, of the uh, wildflower meadow on the Great Lawn was a fantastic opportunity to bring colleges together. Um, when the horses were here um, doing the harvesting, uh, cutting the, the meadow and then turning the meadow, and uh, then we did some carting as well, uh, we had the opportunity to, to see quite a few of our colleagues. Um, uh, the idea for the horses and the, the contacts with the horses came from um, Sergio, the head gardener, and his team over at Christ College, and of course Joe Cobb um, over at Murray Edwards. So immediately you, you have that that connection. Uh, then of course sharing the wildflower seed has uh, has been such a useful thing, and, and Paul over at Christ College has been uh, over at Jesus College. Sorry. Paul at Jesus College has been incredibly innovative, as I said, with his Henry Hoover, <laughs> and uh, and uh, has been back to to take away uh, more bales to uh, to sort of you know spread the love. And uh, you know, we, we're we're seeing more and more people coming online. Uh, the new head gardener at uh, Pembroke was over to pick up bales, um, and of course um, uh, she was the previous deputy head gardener at Trinity. And we worked very closely with Trinity on these uh, on the on the harvesting, because uh, uh, Tom came over with his new deputy head gardener and uh, his uh, his apprentice, and uh, with their uh, alpine baler, they have a pedestrian baling machine. And uh, we we had a particularly pleasant uh, couple of days, bailing and uh, uh, setting out the wildflower meadow with the little round bales all over it, which is actually almost almost iconic now. Really, I don't think we're ever going to be able to not do that. <laughs> Steve, I think I'm going to stop you there because we're already running short of time, and I've got a question which I, I'd like Sebastian to talk a little bit about, um, which is: Do nematodes help to fertilise the soil at all? Are you studying any other subsoil organisms such as fungi? And then just to add a little extra spice to that, have, is it, have, are we monitoring carbon in the soil? Is there any evidence that, that it's um, accumulating as a result of the lawn? Sure. We are um, getting short of time, so can we be quick, please? I'll do my best, yeah. Um, so in terms, of, I'll start with the other soil organisms. So no, we haven't been looking at other soil organisms at, so far. And that's simply because, as Cicely mentioned, you know, um, we're doing this based on a volunteer basis. So uh, academics or individuals around Cambridge who have an expertise in a particular area have been volunteering their time to, you know, explore what they're expert of on the lawn. Um, and we simply don't have an expert um, in sort of, you know, soil-borne fungi. But if there is an expert listening in soil-borne fungi and they're interested to have a look, then they are more than welcome uh, to gain contact. Uh, that would be brilliant. 
Uh, in terms of nematodes and soil fertility, absolutely. Um, so because nematodes can form such an integral part of the ecosystem, there are those that will um, be, eat other organisms in the in the soil, for example. And so there is this um, phenomenon called suppressive soils, where uh, the nature of the organisms in the soil can suppress uh, soil-borne diseases that otherwise would damage the, the plants. And so in that way, uh, there will be you know um, ecosystems where you can grow a particular plant that you wouldn't be able to grow um, if you know nematodes weren't there, um, for example. And the final question uh, in terms of carbon, uh, I haven't been involved in this directly, but I understand that yes, we've been also surveying the carbon content of the of the soil and, and no doubt this has increased on the on the meadow side uh, compared to the, um, the, the the lawn side. Um, as a result of putting in the wildflower meadow. Great, thank you, Sebastian. So we really are running short of time, so I'm just going to do one more question, I'm afraid. Um, we've had a lot of interest in, are we going to expand uh, the area of lawn? Uh, are we thinking about covering the front lawn? Are we looking at other areas of college uh, and so on? Um, and in particular, I like this question, are you going to extend the lovely wildflower meadow to the rest of the back lawn? Hashtag lawn is boring as well as ecocidal, thank you. Um, so um, the, the short answer to that is yes, we're thinking about it, but no, we don't yet have any definite plans. Um, I think those of you who have had any relationship with Cambridge, which is probably almost all of you, will know that it's not a place where change happens quickly. There's an old adage here that, that slow change is good, but no change is better. Um, so actually, I feel we've done remarkably well to make the changes we've already achieved. We certainly are, and I think everybody on this panel would love to extend the lawn tomorrow, uh, the wildflower meadow to the whole lawn tomorrow. Uh, we're certainly looking at possibilities. Um, I think it is going to be important to retain some formal lawn because of the sorts of events that the college uh, runs uh, on the back lawn. But I think uh, getting a different mixture to we currently have between formal lawn and wildflowers, hopefully with more wildflowers is something that we're certainly looking at. There is a built-in review process uh, in what the college has agreed in another three years time. So if it doesn't happen before then, I very much hope that we'll see an expansion uh, at that point. Now, I'm very sorry that we are gonna to have to stop now. Um, we've had an enormous number of questions uh, and I'm sorry for those we have not managed to answer now. I think we probably will try and answer some of them in writing uh, later on because there's a lot of very interesting questions there. Um, so really just um, I want to finish by um, thanking everybody for attending um, this event. This event. Uh, thank you in particular to Steve, Cicely and Sebastian for sharing their expertise with us, but also uh, for the um, development offices of both King's College and the University who made this possible and also who prepared those fantastic videos uh, that we saw. The uh, event's been recorded, so if you'd like to watch it again, then feel free, but perhaps more relevantly, please do pass on to other people who might be interested that it will be viewable uh, after the event. Um, as you've heard, there's a number of small projects going on in connection with the wildflower meadow. So for example, the Otter Holt, we'd like to have some benches so that people walking through the meadow can sit down and so on. Um, if anyone's interested in supporting those uh, or indeed just interested in getting some more information, um, please do contact Lorraine Hayden at the King's uh, Development Office. Uh, she'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, so once again, thanks to everyone um, and um, that's the end of this event.